Hi, I'm Stephanie Hoover, and I'm a nonfiction author specializing in history, crime, folklore, and the 19th century spiritualism movement. The book that I'm going to be reading from today is The Keller's Massacre, Politics and Murder in Pennsylvania's Anthracite Coal Country. In short, the book discusses the 1934 massacre of innocent parade attendees in the small town of Calares in Klein Township, Schuylkill County. It was a politically motivated horror and still one of the most deadly political killings in American history. The excerpt I'm going to be reading comes from chapter 6. It's called A Parade Ends in Bloodshed. November 5th, 1934 was Election Eve in every one of the 48 states in the nation, except Maine, the residents of which had voted in September. Polling indicated that the Democrats enjoyed a consistent national lead running up to the election, so pundits focused more on state-level elections, particularly those in Pennsylvania and Nebraska, where it was all about the New Deal or No Deal. The race in Pennsylvania was expected to be tight, Everyone, Republicans, Democrats, newspapers, community groups, churches, urged voters to get out and do their civic duty. The state's voter registration topped four million names more than at any previous time. Three quarters of those registered voters were expected to turn out. Although overall percentages favored the Republicans, Trending seemed to favor the Democrats, whose registration had increased over the previous two years, while their opponents had declined. Only half of the state's precincts would vote using machines. Nearly 4,000 polling places were still using paper ballots. Pennsylvania's Democratic candidates were not only supportive of FDR, they also ran almost exclusively on Roosevelt's policies and coattails. Republicans responded with a call to vote for a square deal, not a new deal, and believed the Commonwealth's voters would soundly reject the president's excessive spending. In Calaire's, the evening of November 5, 1934, was cool and dark. The sun fully set just before 5 o'clock. The waning moon barely offered light. Emboldened by the strides the party was making nationally and by their belief that they had indeed won the 1933 local elections, the Democrats of Klein Township felt good about their chances. This, they believed, was the year that Joe Bruno's reign as Republican boss would finally end. Both parties held election eve rallies. The Dems met in McAdoo. The Republicans met in Joe's pool hall slash party headquarters. If Joe sensed defeat, he didn't show it publicly. But behind the scenes, there were rumblings about his growing anger. Some said he'd been making threats toward the Democrats. Privately, he must have doubted whether his machine could withstand another close or stolen election. At about nine o'clock that evening, someone suggested a parade. Democrats and Bruno opponents both turned out by the dozens in the well-dressed style befitting the 1930s. No one disagrees that the Democrats purposefully approached the Bruno home. Very few argue about what happened when they did. Only the Brunos debated the source of and reason for the gunfire. The intersection of Center and 4th Streets in Calaire's is small. To stand in it and imagine being fired on is horrifying. There's no place to hide and running only served to make victims moving yet still clearly visible targets. There are varying versions of how and when the shooting actually started. Some said the shots fired over the heads of children were a signal to the Brunos that the parade was forming. Other witnesses said that it was Tony Orlando who first fired a pistol into the crowd while standing on the front lawn of Joe Bruno's home. Other accounts place a shooter on Center Street between the Saladago Drugstore and the Immaculate Conception Church 
firing on the marchers as they turned to go past Joe Bruno's house. Still others say it was James Bruno, who lived next door to his father, Joe, who fired the first shots from his own yard while shouting, What the hell are you people doing here? However it began, so many shots were fired in such rapid succession that the first callers to the police substation in Tamaqua reported machine gun fire in the tiny town of Calares. The first man to fall was Frank Fiorella. He was standing on the northwest corner of the intersection in front of what was then the Margo building, a butcher shop with second floor apartments. The 20 gauge rifle pellets fractured his skull and pierced his brain. The resulting intracranial hemorrhage killed him outright. Investigators calculated that 26 people were injured in the shooting, although it must have been a daunting task to discern the wounded from the bystanders, many of whom were unharmed, but splashed with the blood of fellow parade marchers. Even the American flag lay on the ground dotted with tiny holes left by deadly shotgun pellets. Sometime after midnight, when Election Eve officially passed into Election Day, the rain started. By the relative safety of the light of dawn, Joe Bruno and other occupants of his home were, under armed protection, ushered into waiting police cars and taken to the Tamaqua substation for questioning before being driven to the Schuylkill County Prison. There was no sunlight when the rest of the town woke, but the sky was sufficiently bright for residents of Kellairs to see the puddles of mud and blood standing in their streets. The lust for revenge was palpable, but not the kind the Bruno clan had dispensed. The retaliation Keller sought was the kind that would hurt Joe Bruno far more than bullets ever could. That's my excerpt of The Kellers Massacre, Politics and Murder in Pennsylvania's Anthracite Coal Country. It's my best-selling book, so unfortunately I don't have any signed copies for sale, but you can order it from the publisher, the History Press, or other book retailers, and of course from Amazon. For more information on this or any other of my books, visit stephaniehoover.com. Thanks for listening and be well.